Several years ago, my husband was offered a job in Hong Kong. When we told our boys we were moving, we sold it as a challenging adventure. Our middle son, Matthew, who was eight, was having none of it. <laughs> He was inconsolable. What about my friends? We tried to reassure him. He said, "You'll be back. You'll have us, and you'll make new friends." He knew we were going for two years. He looked at us and said, "And then I'll have to leave them too." <laughs> Smart kid, right? <laughs> when we got to when we moved, Matthew was mostly okay. The person who was miserable was me. For months, and the thing that made me most miserable was that I missed my friends. Today, I understand more clearly why. I'm a science writer, and I've spent the last two years reporting on the biology and evolution of friendship. For centuries, friendship was considered cultural, not biological, valued but not invaluable. It was, it was hard to define, hard to measure, and therefore hard to study. And in certain scientific circles, it was the F word of serious research. <laughs> Seriously. Um, but then, in 1988, one of the first significant papers came out connecting health and social relationships. They're as important as diet and exercise. But why exactly? So fast forward 15 years and cut to Africa, where primatologists were observing the social behavior of baboons. Among the baboons was a nasty piece of work they called Sylvia. There she is, the queen of mean. <laughs> Sylvia terrorized everyone, and she pretty much only groomed with her daughter Sierra, until Sierra was killed by a lion. I know. <laughs> Lo and behold, Sylvia started being nice. She started approaching other baboons with a grunt that is baboon for "I come in peace." <laughs> What said the scientists? It got them thinking about social relationships differently, and asking what would push a grumpy baboon to seek them out. Eventually, they worked out that compared to everything they could measure. One of the most crucial factors for survival and reproductive success was the strength of social bonds. The strength, in other words, of friendships. Yes, they started calling them that, and here's why: because what mattered most was the quality of the bonds, not their origin, not whether it was relatives or not. What mattered were bonds that were stable, positive, and cooperative. So what does this mean for us? We may have relationships upside down. On the one hand, we prioritize them based on blood and law, not quality. We ditch our friends when we fall in love, and we ignore them when we're busy with work and family. On the other hand, when we're with our friends, we often treat them with more respect than we do our relatives and romantic partners. I don't criticize the way my friend loads the dishwasher, <laughs> and when I disagree with them, I try to do it gently. The science of friendship blurs those lines. It suggests we should invest in relationships in a way that delivers strong bonds. We should value people who are positive, stable, cooperative forces in our lives. Good friends most consistently meet that definition. Maybe your spouse, like mine, or your sister does, but the divorce rate and the annual advice on surviving the holidays <laughs> tell us how often those relationships let us down. And even if they don't, you need a bench. That's what I didn't have in Hong Kong. Back up. Are you living your life as if positive relationships matter most? Do you prioritize your time that way? How often do you cancel on your friends? Do you treat the people close to you well and demand to be treated well in return? When was the last time you snapped at your partner like you never would a friend? 
And do you recognize and appreciate friendship when you see it? Even I miss it. Back in 2016, I spent a week in Puerto Rico watching Rhesus macaques socialize. They sit in close proximity and they groom each other, strengthening their bonds. I came home and I found my oldest son, Jacob, who was 17, right where I left him, hanging on the couch with his best friend Christian playing NBA 2K. <laughs> I went straight to exasperated. Don't you ever do anything else? But as soon as I said it, I realized they were doing something else. They were sitting in close proximity and doing the human equivalent of grooming, <laughs> laughing and talking and strengthening their bond. Sure, they, watch, or they play too many video games, but they were about to leave home for different colleges, and I knew that. Think what would happen if we made friendship the template for all relationships. It would make us less mean, like Sylvia, it would help us live longer, it would change how we love, work, and parent. And in this time when we are struggling with an epidemic of loneliness and bitter political divisions, it would remind us what joy and connection look like and why they matter. Thank you. <laughs>